one recently oh see there we go uh jonathan just trying to figure out what number we're at welcome to another episode of war dice i'm gonzo from more than dice and i'm john from war buddies and we have no idea what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> at all we actually have a special guest special guest go ahead and introduce yourself i'm red uh i am a competitive warcaster player and uh just recently played a bunch of warcaster at adepticon great time this will be episode 11 by the way i found the episode we're on yeah we're so prepared <laughs> <laughs> we're professionals gone through. yeah well i i have been paid for an episode so uh that's technically a professional <laughs> all right so that's on you then <laughs> uh today is going to be our our adepticon review adepticon you know type thing for warcaster uh if you did not see it um on more than dice we did a war machine recap uh with the minority report and tried and true people um and it's always good and fun to do that um which there's going to be some new stuff coming from more than dice. So if you're interested in ju not just war machine stuff or not just hobby stuff, pay close attention because that's coming up. Jonathan, you got anything coming up with uh, war budgies? Uh, as far as the channel goes, not a whole lot. We are packing up for a big move this summer, but uh, I'm actually sitting here building terrain for the Boker Brawl event. I'm running a giant war machine siege scenario at Boker Brawl this year. And I talked to um, the Boker Brawl people and they're very excited to see what you do. It is going to be a spectacle, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, Red, are you planning on going anywhere anytime soon? Any events you're allowed to hit? No, I'm getting ready to go to Gen Con, but unfortunately there's no Warcaster events there. I am planning on going to Warfare Weekend. I'm thinking about possibly going to Nova, but once again, like I typically play Warcaster as my primary and then War Machine as my secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, I am getting ready. Like I've got my cameras set up now. I'm starting to get graphics together because I'm wanting to start producing some Warcaster like competitive battle reports and stuff. Yes. In like a tried and true style fashion. Uh, so I'm currently gathering assets for that, but we'll see what happens uh, uh, in the future. That's awesome, dude. That's good. I mean, there there's needed. I don't, I don't have the materials, the time to do competitive battle reports like they do. But um, I'll look forward to that because that'd be pretty awesome uh, to see that out there. Um, yeah. Type thing. Uh, I'm kind of shocked that you told me that they're not doing any Warcaster events at Gen Con. Not that I've seen currently, but I usually work Gen Con. Uh, I do. I do play testing for the World of Darkness and stuff like that, and then I also run uh, the World of Darkness for the wreck with the Wrecking Crew mm -hmm. uh, at Gen Con, so I'm usually doing a lot of role-playing stuff there. Gotcha. Um, and then this is going to be the first year that my wife is going to go with me, so I'm trying to keep all of my time available so that I can spend time with her and not just, like, ditch her and go play war games. Smoke <laughs> uh, <It's my> bomb. <laughs> which is probably the smart call, yeah. Uh, but like, I'm really excited for the war machine narrative that they have there. The stuff that Jonathan's doing is just great. And I can hardly wait to see the war caster stuff you're doing, Jonathan. Like, I, I really want to see that. <laughs> I really want to talk about it, but it's a little too soon. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, off topic a little bit, since you do world of darkness, favorite, uh, clan. My favorite clan is the Ravnos. Really? Yeah, I... Okay, so I, this has been War Dice. We're kicking Red off the show now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a nomad at heart. Like, I, I, I've lived on the East Coast. I've lived in Italy. I've lived in Germany. Like, I travel a lot. Uh, and so, like, the nomadic nature of the Ravenos is something that I, I really, really love. Yeah. That's cool, dude. See, I, was, I played Bruja a lot, so... You know, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're kind of in there. They're cool, too. <laughs> yeah. So before we get started, uh, Red, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into Warcaster, why you're doing it. I mean, you and I met last year at uh, Adepticon and got to play. Yeah, last uh, year at Adepticon at the tournament, yeah. yeah. Uh, so why don't you give us a little background of who you are, what you do, you know, why you like Warcaster, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been playing war games since middle school when Battletech First Edition came out. That was like my first war game. 
uh, and then I transitioned over to 40k uh, and uh, played that all the way from Rogue Trader. I ended up opening up my own role playing store and ran that for like three 30 years or so. Man. Uh, and so we were mainly focused on war games, and that ate up a lot of my time and everything like that. And I always wanted to be decent at a war game, but never could put in the time to you know, memorize stats and study strategy in depth because I was running a store. Yeah. Um, recently, though, when Warcaster came out, I always said that if Privateer Press ever made a sci-fi game, that would be the game for me because I loved War Machine and the tight rule system, and I knew that they would do a great job with it. Oh, yeah. And so when the Kickstarter hit, I was all in. And then my game group, who also likes sci-fi, they were all in. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the pandemic hit. Uh, and so, luckily, we were playing with with our game group. Uh, Skirmish ended up taking off online, which was different than what we played. We played primary. We play primary all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different take on the game. And so we started up a podcast called the Hyper News Network. Uh, and it was just a um, group of friends like you were coming into our living room and just sitting down and listening to us talk. Uh, as the game moved on, though, it, it uh, started to um, skirmish, in my opinion, isn't as balanced as primary. And so it started to eat on us and a couple of other podcasters and stuff like that. And we kind of moved away from the podcasting scene. But uh, we kept playing primary. Uh, we enjoy the heck out of it. And so now I go every year to Adepticon specifically to, to play in the championship. And I'm hoping to continue to build the excitement for this war game because it is truly a unique space in, in gaming um, when it comes to tempo-based games. And I'm really finding myself in love with tempo-based war games over attrition-based war games. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at and what I did. I did a small stint on, we started up uh, for Rivenstone. We started up a small podcast called The Barracks Action uh, with Sneaky, who was another uh, warcaster, podcaster at the time. Uh, unfortunately, real life got in the way, so I had to step away from that. But now my time is opening up a little bit and I'm finding my love for warcaster again. All right. Awesome. I'm going to tell you right now, when you and I played at uh, Adepticon, and yes, it was a championship, and I put quotes around that um, (laughs) type thing, um, I I mean, I had a blast with you. You and I, we were laughing and joking and just having a good time. We were like, yeah, you're going to kick the crap out of me. Well, well, you did kick the crap out of me, and you know, there was just good fun um, type thing going on, and that's one thing I really liked about what I've seen from the Warcaster community in those yeah. heavy, and I, I, I want to say it's a championship. You know, it, it doesn't feel like a tournament like we used to when we played War Machine. You know, it's mm-hmm. much, it's, it's, it's much more relaxed and everything, which I thought was great. Uh, and everybody was having a good time, and we were laughing. And and it's still a, a game in its infancies, if you really think about it. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And there's no meta list. Put quotes around that. There's no perfect list. There's no perfect cards. There's no perfect units. Everybody's still trying and feeling out stuff, which I think is what really makes these, you know, events really kick off and make it work good. Um, so I, I've noticed that there's been an uptick on uh, different pages and discords for Warcaster. Yep. And I've actually noticed some um, 40K players taking notice because uh, some of them aren't happy with uh, what 10th edition is doing. And so they're looking for a new sci-fi game. And I'm like, check out Warcaster. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So you played in all the events in at Adepticon, all the Warcaster events? Yes, I did. So uh, I got the train heist on uh, the first day and then the pod race and then the championship. Those so, photos looked amazing, by the way. Yeah. So tell us about uh, the uh, the mag train because I didn't get to participate in it. Um, and so tell our viewers about what it was and you know your thoughts on it and what was going on. So this was my absolute favorite event of the whole Adepticon uh, experience. Uh, they had Tinker Turf terrain, which is beautiful terrain. Mm-hmm. Like if you get a chance to take a look at it, it's it's just gorgeous. And they used the maglift train from Tinker Turf, and so there was ten sections of track. 
that uh, went down two boards and we had four players for the event. And luckily we had one of each faction, which was just nice. a fluke. <laughs> it was, it was crazy good. Uh, we divided into two teams and we sat cat a corner from each other so that we would have be surrounded by enemies. And uh, starting on the second turn of the first pulse round, the train would come onto the track and each turn it would move one track. Uh, so that it would be, there would be a section of train on the track at all points in the game, except for first and last turn, because there was three sections of train. And the objective was to end your activation on the train so that you could get a portable objective and then take that portable objective to your deployment zone to score points. Nice. Uh, the, the whole while we're fighting with each other. Uh, Travis let us uh, do a little bit of cool rules. So we had... Uh, if a person was in front of the train when it moved onto the track, they just died because uh, the train <laughs> ran them over. Uh, but if it was a large base or extra large base, it would stall the train. It would still kill the jack, but the jack would slow the train down so it wouldn't move. So you could actually get in front of it. Uh, you could destroy the track and derail the train, killing everybody on board. Uh, <laughs> and you That's could re- nuts. I know it was crazy. Uh, and you could repair the track too. If it, so, like if a section was destroyed and the first part of the train derailed, it would decouple, and then you could repair the track, and the rest of the train would continue on. Like it was, it was just crazy. Uh, and you could also get the portable objectives from the derailed section of car, so you know, so that we wouldn't accidentally destroy our objective. Um, it was just a blast. Uh, ISA was who I was partnered up with, and I was playing Imperians, and we got to the train just after the Nemesis, of course, because uh, the Nemesis, yeah. Uh, yeah, supercharged across the board. Uh, and we ended up uh, taking the train and trying to fight everybody off, uh, which probably wasn't the best thing because we didn't take any portable objectives off the train. We just fought with people on the train. (laughs) Uh, At one point uh, I had a Sentinel that was on a platform and I leapt from the top of the platform onto the train, which was hilariously good. Uh, Another person got slammed off the moving train. uh, And that was fun. And in the end, Marcher's world speed uh, was our downfall (laughs) because once they got to the train, it was just slip displace, uh, reactivate, moving, slip displaces. It was just, it was crazy. Um, but it was really, really cool. So it was a uh, AC and ISA victory uh, on the train job. That's but awesome. It was a lot of fun. You know, it, I, I played in the narrative war machine, and we were asking stuff like you did, you did. Can we do this? And they're like, yeah, sure, why not? And it reminded me of a good role-playing session yep. with miniatures type thing. Yeah. And, and, and to me, that's what a narrative should be. There isn't, should be this hardcore, you know, and unless you've got it set up, but I mean, this was, this was like a first time we haven't done mm-hmm. this in Warcaster and they were, and I'm sure Travis was, his brain was in, you know, GM mode going, yeah, well, why can't you blow up the track? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it was a ton of fun, and I, I'm hoping that Travis will write up the scenario so other people can play it. I did do a small write-up on one of the discords uh, so that people could uh, try it out and everything like that, but it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. I read that one, dude, and I got excited just reading the recap of it. Oh, for the pod race, when I did the recap of the pod race? Yeah. Yeah. So nice. what, what what was the pod race? Because uh, Travis and I had talked about this last year, mm-hmm. and he was like, it's going to be a pod race where you just go down this line and Sand Raider type people would try to kill you as you were going by. So right. how did it actually get all fleshed out finally? So originally the idea was to have an entire table row, and we would be racing down the entire length of the table. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately due to space constraints and stuff like that, we only had – two of the newer style mats uh, to play on. So uh, I came up with, uh, why don't we use the, because there's like a red line on one side of the maps, and then there's like this orange line on the other. And I was like, why don't we go in a circle uh, around it? And we'll go down the red line on one side, cut around the end, come up the orange, and then everything in the center would be your deployment zones. Uh, And then that way you wouldn't, your, your Tusken Raider guys could fire on both sides. Uh, very easily. Uh, and so we decided to do that. Uh, we put checkpoints at the two curves on the first and second turn and checkpoints in the middle of the two maps so that we could get small heals. Uh, and you gained a victory point for every checkpoint that you passed. 
you also gained a victory point for every vehicle that you killed um, <laughs> for the Tusken Raider guys. And we only played seven deployment cost uh, past our Raiders, so we all selected a very, very small force. And we started with our racers on the line and one gate uh, in the deployment zone. And you could deploy, you could put your gate anywhere. Uh, and so that was it. And then we just basically played pretty standard to the to the vehicle race mode at that point. Um, it was a I did a color commentary on the uh, well, it started off as just me commenting on the rounds and then I got a little bored and started uh, coloring it up a little bit. Uh, but you can see that on the discord in the in the in the in the battle report section. Um, but, uh, unfortunately we all made it to the first turn. Uh, we, we were jockeying back and forth me and the ISA player for first place. And you could only fire at the person in the lead. Uh, his regulators came out and they really did a number on us, uh, with the amount of damage they put out with them and the witch hounds. Uh, and so we were damaged up pretty good. And the AC player just kind of hung towards the back where we couldn't shoot at him. Um, <laughs> And then as we hit the first turn, the ISA player was trying to get around this wall to get out of line of sight because we were we were getting low on hit points. And the AC player just ran forward, meleeed me in a massive explosion as he flew through me and then gunned down the ISA player. So we 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 made it to the first turn, but that was it. <laughs> we did <laughs> not get to finish the race uh, before everybody was dead. Classic uh, AC. Yeah, <laughs> but... That was another one that was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the race mode and everything. Um, I think next year I'll suggest that we have a little bit more hit points uh, so that we can it, hopefully make it to the second turn or into the second straightaway <laughs> before dying. But still, it was a, it was a great blast. Uh, it was another very fun narrative event, um, uh, which I'm really, really enjoying. Yeah, because uh, Travis, when Travis had talked to me about it, we were talking about uh, last year's Adepticon, and I was like, "That sounds like a lot of fun. You could just, you know, and and, and the game allows it because these vehicles can, you know, book off and do some really cool stuff and everything." Mm -hmm. So I was really, really, I'm happy that it went off. Um, we yeah. are looking at using that once if Travis gives us the the you know, the write up, we can have that at warfare weekend. Cause I know that people are looking for, uh, more fun things to do besides, you know, just, just championship stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think this Adepticon, the mixture of narrative to championship was a very good mix. Um, we had fun events leading up to the championship, which was going to be a more competitive event this year than, than the first year that we did it, where it was because we did nothing but tournaments. It was more casual. This year was going to be more of a actual like tournament tournament. So the narratives leading up to it was, was perfect. They were the, they were a palate cleanser that, uh, was well needed. Yeah. I agree. Uh, that's something I noticed too, is it, 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 the, the pattern, of events was narrative championship narrative you know or and, and people, some people were saying it's a fun event a serious event and a fun event but i mean you really can't say that you it was a narrative relax chill get yourself in the mood to play the game mm -hmm. take it a little bit serious you know pull out all your stops and then celebrate at the end with another fun you know silly thing to go with it yeah, absolutely like a warm -up. yeah yeah and I, and I think that's that's there were a lot of people they're very very happy with the way uh, Privateer Press set that up and it was done that way and people were just enjoying their own self all weekend because mm -hmm. if you weren't playing the narrative you played in the tournament but it was I mean there were so many people that had a blast it was not even funny yeah this year <laughs> I really felt that old school Mark II community vibes oh yeah like. The entire privateer press area was was energetic. Like it was just it was just energized. Everybody was happy and having a great time. Oh yeah, there was that. So tell me about the competitive, the the championship. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's where I didn't get to see, but I did see that y'all were working on it. And I was I was in the middle of the narrative event at War Machine, so I didn't get to see right. Much. Right. So the competitive event, that was actually competitive. It was, uh, I brought my hyper efficient 
competitive list to this uh, because I was wanting to, to win another medal. Uh, and um, my two opponents were trying out some new lists uh, to try to see how the competitive scene was. I think they didn't benefit as much as I did because I play every single week uh, and had been playing, you know, quite a bit. Uh, and they their metas weren't as stable. Uh, and I think as we get further along, we're going to see more stable metas develop. And so the competition will go get a little bit higher and higher. Yeah. Um, the, the first, uh, there was only three of us because one of the people had to drop out. Uh, he just wasn't feeling good that day. Uh, so we had me, the AC player that was from the two narratives, and the ISA player from the two narratives. Uh, the AC or ISA and AC faced off in the first game, uh, and they had a really tight, close game. Um, it was really fun to watch that because uh, they were back and forth the entire time. Uh, the unfortunate part was is when I started playing, I I I've gotten a lot more practice than they had, so it was very hyper efficient, and uh, they were on the back legs uh, for the most of the game. Uh, but we all sat and we talked and we had a good time about, you know, here's strategies. And so it was like a shift from the narrative where we we're just doing silly stuff all the time mm -hmm. uh, to a let's talk about competition and, you know, uh, let's talk about efficiencies. I remember the big convert, uh, uh, conversation was how to use your sideboard effectively, mm -hmm. which I don't think a lot of people do that. Uh, and then primarily the figure what Tolkien does in a game and how he hyper hype he creates a hyper efficiency in yep. armies yep uh and how people sometimes I, I don't know if misuse is the appropriate term because they'll usually play him forward uh and he gets killed because anybody who knows what he does wants to to kill him <laughs> But I typically, what I'll do is I'll use my sideboard to side out some of my jacks, uh, and then I use the sideboard to pair down to a 12-card deck, and then Tolkien will sit behind some terrain where nobody can get to him. I'll ditch all my three jack cards underneath him, and now I'm running a nine-card efficiency deck with Myra Hurst giving me six cards in hand. That's good, dude. Yeah, so I'm cycling oh, my yeah. cards every other turn at that point and seeing all my cards every other turn, uh, which is just hyper-efficient uh, when it comes to needing those reactivators or mortality, uh, you know, displays, or my mortality to stabilizers and stuff like that to bring units back, or displacement index just to be able to get things to objectives that I don't want to activate. Yep. Um, it just becomes extremely efficient. And I think a lot of players, like, if you, if you don't play with Tolkien... I think you should, to be honest. I, I think he is way too good of a piece. Now, he is a piece that just sits in the back, and once he's done his job, he's done his job. But um, also, like, if you do end up summoning a jack, you can just activate him and play any of your three jack cards. So it's like a hand extender on top of that. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, I just think he's really, really efficient. I, I think I summoned one jack the entire game, or the entire of the tournament, because I don't tend to play jacks a lot in primary tournaments. Uh, they're just in case piece, and I do all my work with squads and solos and stuff like that. Yeah. He's definitely one of those pieces where the best uses for him are not really intuitive when you read his rules, I don't think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Think about yeah. Because you see that fury side of him, and then you decide you want to try to play him forward, and then he just dies, and you don't really see him. But if mm -hmm. you use him to, like make your deck hyper efficient he's just amazing he's an amazing yeah. piece yeah that that's my thing is burning through your deck as quickly as possible to get the cards you need when you need them is one of the key things of the game that you've got to you've got to learn how to work your deck absolutely i mean because you're, you're gonna need that one card and you're gonna like oh this is the perfect time to play this card mm -hmm. you're like i burnt through it yes you're just burning yeah. through that deck as quickly as possible and holding a large hand since it's a very limited size deck, I mean, it's not like 60 cards. So you're yeah. burning through your deck pretty quickly. Right. And with my rehearsed, I'm sitting on a six-card hand, so there's only three cards in my deck. Yeah. 
at that point. So like when I spin my three cards this turn, I'm drawing the rest of my deck at this point. You know, like it's um it's it's just really, really good. Um and uh another thing like uh, so yeah, him and Amira are just very hyper efficient. Like I think at one point I was cycling so fast that I was encrypting or encrypted commanding on my Harlan sec almost every turn to be able to reactivate him and strip a card from my opponent every single turn. <laughs> and like such a that, dick maneuver. <laughs> I know. I felt so horrible. Like I felt really, really bad. But like it got to a point to where like he would be like go and then just set his hand on the table like towards me. And I was like, oh God, I feel I, I feel like such a brute. I <laughs> it's like so upset. Well, well, but, and yeah. that's the thing is it, you, you are playing the game. The the opponent, I'm 100% sure, is like, he's not being a dick. He's just got a really good thing going on. Right, yeah. yeah. And I don't think anybody would think anything of that. They're just like, they're like, damn it. I'm going to put that card in there. I'm going to put that in there so I can <laughs> get other people with it too. Right. Yeah, well, at one at one point, he just started playing cards at the end of his pulse round. He's like, this is so that you don't take it from me. I'm going to impulse induce, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> like, he just knew it was coming, you know, like, it was like. But yeah, th that's a good workaround. I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. make sure you don't use and abuse the cards that I want. So to make sure to put it back in there. Right. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it was a great uh, experience for, for all of us because we did learn some we did learn a lot about the competitive nature of the game and the, the competitive side. I think it's really cool, because going back to what Gonzo said about the meta still existing and still kind of growing, mm -hmm. like, the major cons like this are a really cool chance for experimentation. Like Absolutely. You get players from all different strategies and all these different armies coming together to just run their stuff against each other and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The the ISA player, he was trying out a brand new, like, he had, he had came up with a concept and, and what was good about his concept, like I looked at it, my, so my main ISA player in my in my meta, uh, he is a very efficient player. And I saw this ISA player coming up with this idea, and I was like, yes, that is exactly where my, my friend Tom had went at one point. Like, you're on the right track. You're, you're, you're starting to see some of the efficiencies, because he was playing a lot of Defender and stuff like that, which... Uh, I was like, yes, that is a good synergy in ISA uh, on occasion to play. Well, I mean, so let's talk about the future. Uh, we do have certain things coming out um, soon, hopefully. Um, what's the future looking like for Warcaster? Red, why don't you go? What do you think? So Lost Legion's coming, and I think Lost Legion, I'm really hoping that the rules for Lost, so I don't know anything, which is great. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I can just speculate all I want. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think Lost Legion's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, I am hoping that they will have uh, some synergies that, like I'm hoping that they're going to be applying a lot of Null and Fire. Like uh, those specific to uh, conditional effects. Uh, one thing with uh, Imperium's hyper efficiency that we don't deal well with is null, and we don't deal well with uh, being able to get con uh, uh, these uh, continuous effects off of our models. So fire does affect us uh, a lot more effectively uh because it's downing our our, our stats which are, are decent stat lines and we've already seen the flamethrowers so like we know they're going to do fire i'm hoping they have some null uh i'm hoping that they do have some other efficiencies in there because like they're not going to be have access to tolkien uh because he doesn't work for them so i'm hoping that there will be some sort of a, a replacement on card efficiency with them uh, definitely like a six card hand generator of some sort or something of that nature uh, I'm very curious what their reactivators on the on the start are going to be because we saw with like Kickstarter one and two where we only had uh, a, an activator per type. So like, you know, AC could reactivate this and marchers could reactivate jacks and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to what what they're going to start off with before they broaden out because I'm I'm thinking they're going to come in two waves. Past that, uh, the next army after that, I don't know. I am kind of hoping, like a couple of us have speculated on the discords, that there might be a second edition coming. I know it's too soon, 
But at the same time, we would like to see it focused down to that mid tier where we're doing like 11 twos on a four by four with primary missions and four, four horse rounds so that the time length of the game is a little bit more and maybe a little rebalancing on the skirmish side. We don't know. Uh, but I'm just really excited for the, for the new stuff to come. Really excited. Yeah, I, I'm really looking for the new hype. Um, like I said, a lot of people are starting to pick up the game. A lot of people are starting to look at it. People are, you know, taking notice now, which is good. I mean, we're coming off of, you know, pandemic inning and people are starting to get mm -hmm. back in the store. So this is the time. Get your models. Go Absolutely. out to the store. Play at a store. Get people hyped so they can start playing it too. Show off, yeah. Yep. Yeah, get two starters, even if you have to just sit there and paint while you're waiting for people and offer demos, and sooner or later somebody will start playing regular with you, and then once you got that, then they'll start to buy, and then you'll start to build a meta at that point. It just takes dedication. Yeah, I actually have a starter I need to give away. Uh, I bought the Empyrean, which, uh, to do demos, and everybody around me has already started picking up stuff, so it's put together, it's not painted or anything, so I'm going to look to probably give that away to somebody on uh, probably the Warcaster page, so keep an oh, eye nice. out on there, and I'll, uh, whoever, you know, whatever, I'll maybe just do a random pick, I don't know, um, I will send you the starter for Imperium. Nice. That's a good starter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very legit. Jonathan, what do you got? <laughs> You're a funny guy, Gonzo. Uh, I don't know, there's a lot that's coming down. I don't want people to get the idea that the uh, Privateer Press has forgotten about it or that we've already seen kind of the heyday of, of uh, Warcaster. There's a lot of room to grow, both in the sense of the narrative, having this giant science fiction narrative with thousands of years of history that we're just now touching on. We'll be getting into that. And there's, yeah, th there's a lot going on behind the scenes to bring more content, more things to both shake up the meta and, like I said earlier, to kind of help stabilize the meta. Uh, the power level, power creep, that kind of stuff is something we're keeping a real close eye on as we're engaging these new armies. So it's kind of a slow process because it's one of those, mm -hmm. here, here's an idea. Okay, stop. How does that fit in as a power level with everything? And how does that fit in directly versus this faction or this faction? So it's a very meticulous process, but I think the results we've had so far are really, are really going to excite people. Oh yeah, I mean, for people that think that they probably interpreted and forgot about the game, they're horribly wrong. It's still yep. there. It's still a great game. It's just everything is hitting so fast and so hard for Privateer Press right now that, mm -hmm. you know, that's the reason why Jonathan is the man for Warcaster stuff. <laughs> um so uh, we're all looking forward to new stuff. I'm always looking forward to playing the game. It's great. It's fun. Uh, rules are solid. Uh, it's practically, it's easy to pick up, but like hard to master because these, there are a ton of combos people don't see until yeah, it happens oh, yeah. to it. And then they're like, oh, oh yeah. crap. Like, du like double knockdown guns on uh, AC. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Double shooting, throw you back guns or super fast models type thing. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. When you dive deep into this game, you start to see these subtleties that are there that are just not on the surface. And the game becomes like this is one of the most tactically in depth games that I've, I've played in a long time. Oh, yeah. Well, guys, um, that's our pretty much our show. Um, we want to thank Red for coming on and talking about Warcaster. And uh, Red, you're always welcome back. You can always Thanks come for having and me. chat with us. Um, we're going to be keep, of course, we'll be doing an episode like every other week. Um, if Jonathan remembers and reminds me, because I'm an idiot at times. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hear about Adepticon. I didn't get to go this year. <laughs> oh, it was great, man. You missed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was it was really good. Um, there was a lot of people. I think they said they were over 6,000 people this year. Um, and it was packed. There was a ton of new stuff coming out, ton of new games. I picked up a ton of stuff. Spent way too much money. Um but there, it's always a good time. Their VIG was insane. Um, yeah. I was I was lucky to get a VIG bag, and after I totaled up all the stuff, it was almost seven hundred dollars worth of VIG items. 
Good Lord. It yeah. was ridiculously good. Yeah. Ridiculously good. Yeah. I wish I could get that at Warfare Weekend. but uh. <laughs> One day comes. Yeah. Whoa. But, um, so, I, my next Warcaster stuff will probably be at Warfare Weekend. I plan on bringing, I don't know if everything's going to be painted, but Warfare Weekend doesn't require painted except for a couple of events, so you can bring whatever you want. Um, I want to stress to people, please take your armies and go to your local game store and play. Yes. 100% yeah. go play at your local game store. Even if it's just one game, go there because people don't know about the game if they don't see the game. Mm -hmm. And the and, best promotion is you. Yeah. And right now we're in that weird period where we don't, you know, things are getting, are starting to get back into stores, but it's kind of hard. So you're, you're the ambassador. And even if you see, so this is something that happened at warfare weekend last year. And I, I talked to Jonathan briefly about it. Uh, I went to Warfare Weekend and played War Machine instead of Warcaster because the the turnout I knew was going to be a little bit smaller and I just wanted a bigger environment. And I realized how much of a mistake that was because every person that does that is another person not playing Warcaster. Yeah. And you can't grow the events big if you don't show up. So that's why I played at Adepticon. I played nothing but Warcaster. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, just a thing, I know that we're kind of all hesitant to sign up for events. Um, please sign up for events. I know that there was a couple of events where people didn't sign up for it until it was closed and they couldn't sign up for it. So they had to, you know, make the space smaller and couldn't, you know, have as many people. And that's, you know, not good. Sign up for events, no matter what convention you plan on going to, what store you plan on going to. Sign up as soon as you can because if they have to either A, cancel or B, give you le give them less table space and you go and you can't play that's your fault yeah um, make your interest known yes because especially nowadays going to conventions or going to uh game stores space is limited and mm -hmm. if you don't if you don't make it known early they're not going to say they're not going to give the space so yeah. guys that's it for our show um we're gonna play our outro music but uh before we do that red you got anything you want to say or promote or whatever play warcaster that's it <laughs> <laughs> come play with me let's do let's do some gaming cool uh for war dice and more than dice i'm gonzo and i'm john from war budgies and that's red and i'm red there you go uh, <laughs> yeah, i'm sorry <laughs>